This is lecture number seven. We're talking about the operating system layer. The main purpose of the operating system is to manage the system software that manages the computer resources. And I use the term sharing nicely. These are things we need to share. We need to share memory, process, CPU. Now, memory is the act of keeping track of how and where programs are loaded into main memory. So remember, for a program to function, it has to be in main memory. Although secondary memory is bigger, programs are moving secondary memory into main memory. A process is the representation of a program during its execution, and the operating system manages and keeps track of the process during the execution cycle. So a process is simply clicking on Word or PowerPoint, Excel, or anything like that. CPU management determines which process in the main memory gets access to the CPU at any given time. So let's talk about main memory management, the act of keeping track of how and where programs are loaded in the main memory. First of all, main memory is represented as if it's a stack of memory locations. Each, each location is either 8 bits, 16, 32, or 64 bits. Of course, with 32 bits being what we usually use. Each location is addressed by integer that's uniquely identified that part of memory. So I'm at location 0, or I'm at location 2,000, well, 20,000 something. At each location, contains binary data of 8, 16, 32, and 64 bits depending on the computer system. This binary data could represent an image, video, audio, anything that can represent it in binary. If, uh, for example, an image obviously needs more than 32 bits of data, so you'll need as many chunks of memory to hold that particular object. For a program to run, the operating system must move it into main memory, and it does so based on three possible strategies. Single continuous memory, partition memory, or page memory. Single continuous memory breaks up main memory to two sections, one for the operating system and one for the application program. The operating system has to be in main memory because it needs, it's still, it's still a program and needs access to the CPU. And the application part goes in the remainder. Now remember, for this to work, the entire program must be loaded into main memory. So the pro for this is it's simple. The con for this is that it's a waste of memory and CPU time because one, pro one program may not need all this space. So thus, we have partition memory, which basically does, divides up main memory to part that doesn't belong to operating system into chunks. And so basically, you take a program and memory is divided into fixed or dynamic portions, and then the program is loaded into the partition slot that's big enough to hold it. The pro is that you get multiple programs in memory. The cons is that it still leaves empty spaces. So in this example, if I got a program that needed three chunks of memory, there's no place for three chunks to go continuously, but there's still three open spots. So here's the problem. The space is actually being wasted. Page memory management handles this problem by taking a program and actually breaking it up into pages. And then it assigns those pages into frames, and these frames are referenced to particular locations into main memory. When a program is executed, the needed pages are loaded, uh, loaded into unused frames and distributed throughout main memory. So for example, program 1, page 3, is in frame 15, and program 2, page 4, is in frame number 2. The operating system job is to manage where all the pages are in main memory. The pro for this is that more programs in memory plus the entire program doesn't have to be in main memory, just the pages that are needed at the time. This creates what we call virtual memory. The con to this is that constantly the swap between main memory and secondary memory. Too much swapping, which is called thrashing, can seriously degrade system performance. Process management, representation of program during execution. Process management keeps track of a process during its execution cycle. So when a new process wants to get access to the CPU, it triggers a new process. After that, it gets in line and gets ready to be used by the CPU, and that's called a ready state. From the ready state, we move into the running state, where it actually has access to the CPU and actually is running. While in this running state, a couple things can happen. One, it could get interrupted, which means that it gets kicked out and go back into the ready state. It can get interrupted by a virus process or anything that needs the CPU at that moment at that minute. Or it could finish and it will terminate and go into a termination state. Or it could go into a waiting state where it's waiting for input or some event to trigger it. So for example, with Word, it could be waiting for input from the user. 
And once it's out of the waiting state, it has to go back into the ready state and get back in line and get access to the CPU. Now, CPU management determines which process and memory is access to CPU at any given time. The main, the first one we want to discuss is first come, first serve. The process basically says whoever gets there first arrives first. This is very simple, very easy to implement, but it lacks some details in terms of dealing with important factors such as service times or some things just may be more important. So, for example, say you're in an emergency room and you cut your finger and the person, you're in the line first, but a few people back is somebody's having a heart attack. Obviously, the person having a heart attack should get access to the emergency room before you. So with first come, first serve, we don't take into account those important scenarios. Shortest job next basically means whoever has it needs the shortest amount of time gets access to CPU first. Imagine this, you're at a grocery store and in front of you is a person that has a whole bunch of groceries and it'll take them 20 minutes to check out, but you only have one bag of Skittles, for example. Obviously, the person in front needs to let you go first, and so which means you have you need a shorter amount of time access to the cashier. But the only problem with this is that while it's, it, you do get the shortest jobs out, but how do you know how much time everybody needs? And also, if you keep letting the shortest job go next, the longer jobs make it pushed to the back too often. The last one is called round robin. Basically, this distributes process time equally among all ready processes. Each process gets a time slot, which is the same amount of time. And if it's not finished, it goes back to the ready state and wait for a turn again to finish. So, for example, if 20 people need to speak to me after class, I can give everybody 15 seconds. If I can answer that question in 15 seconds, they can leave. If I can't answer that question in 15 seconds, then I need to go back in the line and wait for the turn again. So, so most widely used algorithm and it's considered the most fair because everybody gets the same amount of access to the CPU. And if you're not finished and you're a lot of times go back to begin the line. That ends our lecture on lecture seven.